Okay. Oh, no, this thing is really Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? No, actually it's the other way because it will go like this. So it's like, uh, yeah. like that. Okay. Got you. Okay. How's that working? Yes. Better? All right. Um, okay. This is great. So uh, I, I have two lectures on, on uh, axion experiments. And uh, roughly speaking, Today I'm going to talk about the current generation of experiments and past generations of experiments. And then uh, that tomorrow I'll talk about next generation ideas and R&D and things that are just pipe dreams. Uh, so that's maybe, if you go into this field, those are likely to be the things that you'll be working on eventually. Um, but also I have a little bit of a theory motivation. I looked through the videos from last week. I was hoping that Fabio or uh, Fernaldo would talk about axions, maybe to, to uh, avoid me the embarrassment of, you know, of an experimentalist talking about the vacuum states of QCD and other things that we're not very good at talking about. But I didn't find in those lectures uh, anything to fully explain the axions. So I'm going to do my best to um, explain the motivation for these searches. Um, so first though, why um, WIMPs are so great? Why, not, why do anything else? Um, okay, and remember, I think that, that uh, Fabio did discuss the idea that is sometimes called the WIMP miracle last week, which was the motivation for starting this field in the, in the 1980s. And there was a very simple argument, which you can explain on one slide, uh, which is that you know that in, in the Big Bang, at some um, really early time, uh, everything was very hot. Uh, so for example, uh, the temperature KT was more than the mass of uh, the W and Z bosons. And so all, all states would exist in thermal equilibrium connected by heavy, heavy bosons. Um, and then, uh, as the temperature of the universe cools, um, eventually you go, this, this is the mass of some state, of let's say the dark matter mass. This is uh, time or temperature. And um, eventually, as you go on in time, the temperature falls. And so the abundance, the things are still in thermal equilibrium, so the abundance of your particle is decreasing. Uh, but uh, if the interactions are, are weak, so, so the way that uh, the, the WIMPs or any new particle stays in equilibrium is by collision with other things. So, for example, two WIMPs will annihilate into a, into a boson that will then talk to the standard model. So as long as you're in thermal equilibrium, the uh, WIMPs are disappearing. But then if the, if the cross-section is, is weak, at a certain point, those boson, the, the, the WIMPs will no longer find each other. In, the, in this plasma, and so uh, the, uh, the expansion of the universe will continue and there'll be some residual leftover um, amount of dark matter that can no longer uh, annihilate. So it's, it's frozen out of equilibrium. And the point at which the freeze out occurs depends on the, the, uh, cross the velocity averaged cross section at the time of freeze out. The time tends to be like uh, 20 times, the temperature tends to be like 20 times the uh, um, or one twentieth of the of the mass of the particle, and the freeze out, uh, the cross sections that you need to freeze out uh, are around ten to the minus twenty seven centimeters cubed per second. So um, this it turns out that this uh, this um, this number is something that you can very easily get from the from weakly interacting bosons. Let's say by uh, the uh, lightest supersymmetric particle. That was a motivation for a lot of this research. 10 years ago, the lightest supersymmetric particle, which was uh, a mixture of the Fotino and the, uh, and the, and the Higgs Eno uh, and, and the Bino, this particle was supposed to be stable because there was no other uh, supersymmetric particle for it to decay into and was supposed to have sort of 100 GeV type of, uh, type of mass and interact by the exchange of, um, of, uh, of, of neutral bosons, maybe by exchange of the Higgs or by the squarks, which were in supersymmetry, are, are new bosons. Um, so 
there was great motivation from coming from people who wanted to do collider searches. Um, if you think about the, uh, the cross-section for the thermal freeze-out, there's a generic Feynman diagram where dark matter is annihilating into standard model states. And the, um, this, this velocity average cross-section you need for freeze-out tells you about this diagram. Now let's just suppose nothing changes and you can just rotate the diagram. Well, if you rotate it one direction, st two standard, you rotate it by 180 degrees, you've got standard particle particles like a proton and an antiproton colliding and making dark matter. Or in another direction, you've got, uh, you've got the, the direct detection process. Dark matter comes in, scatters off of a standard model particle like a, uh, a, a, a proton in a nucleus, and you get some energy. Okay, so that's all great. It all, it, you know, um, the only problem was that uh, actually the, the, most the cross sections that are implied by this m in the most, the most straightforward way are way, way up here. Uh, they're like something like 10 to the minus 38 square centimeters. And the idea that this was just, uh, the dark matter was just like a heavy neutrino interacting by exchange of Z bosons, this was crossed off the list very early on in the history of the field. And so the theorists have been very clever. They've always invented, they've continued to invent new ways in which you could have a big asymmetry between the uh, annihilation cross-section that determined the abundance and the scattering cross-section of um, on standard model particles. So you can no longer just rotate this, this Feynman diagram and expect the cross-sections to be about the same. Um, so uh, as a result, they've, they've progressively, um, you know, theorists have progressively suggested new uh, parameter spaces to, to search in that are at ever lower and lower and lower cross-sections. And it will just continue on until, as Tali explained, we're going to hit this neutrino background, which will cause us to give up because the experiments, we run out of liquid xenon on the planet and the experiments just become too expensive and hard to do. So I don't want to say this is a fishing expedition, but it has some of the characteristics of a fishing expedition. Essentially, we've given up on models and we're casting our fishing lines to the left and down into the depths to try to find the wimp. Um, but even I know as, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible fisherman, but I know that if you just cast your, your line at random, you, you seldom catch any fish. You have to get really lucky to actually catch a fish. So, okay, so is there some other idea? You know, the wimps are still exciting. There, there are lots of great ideas, but, but you know, maybe we should be thinking about other options. And so um, the, um, the axion is, 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 uh, is something else that actually is very compelling. It has a little bit more complicated story behind it that you can't explain in one slide like the WIMP miracle, but there is a corresponding axion miracle, which may be every, every bit as compelling as the WIMP miracle. The axions are really in a totally different regime. They, you know, the typical win WIMP mass is 100 GeV. The typical, the most interesting axion mass range is from 2 to 200 micro EV. So I think that's 15 orders of magnitude less. Uh, interestingly, though, the velocity of the particles is the same, and that's because our galaxy has an escape velocity. So if you exceed about a tenth of a percent of the speed of light, then things just fly off into space and they're, no they're not useful as, as dark matter anymore. So you've got the same velocities, but so much smaller mass. Um, it's, it's really surprising then that the, um, in the kinetic energy, okay, it's 10 to the minus 10 EV instead of 100 keV. And this, well, you know that the cosmic microwave background is like uh, around three degrees, which corresponds to something like a milli EV. So if this was in equilibrium with the rest of the universe, these particles would be relativistic and could not be dark matter because they would just escape from the galaxy. So uh, that's weird. These particles have to be thermally not in equilibrium with anything else. Uh, and then they have really long uh, wavelengths. The, the wavelengths of the WIMP are of nuclear dimensions and the wavelengths of the axions are like meters, tens of meters, even hundreds of meters, depending on the mass. And so that leads to totally different phenomenology for the detection. They really behave a lot more like waves than like uh, particles. Um, okay, so now let me talk a little bit about the motivation for the axion models. Uh, so as a, as a naive experimentalist, I know that a neutron, for example, has quarks, has three quarks inside it. And if I think of this just as like a bag with three fractionally charged particles, you know, 
two negative and one positive, I would think, well, you know, there's some charge, there's, there's bound to be some charge separation here on the order of the size of the nucleon. And so this should have an electric dipole moment. It would be very odd if it didn't. I would say the electric dipole moment should be the size of the nucleus times, times an electron. So 10 to the minus 16 electron meters. Um, but uh, experiments looking for electric dipole moment of the neutron have been done since the apparently the 1950s. And even the very first measurements crossed out that naive estimate. And uh, you know this is 10 to the minus 19. I think I changed units a little bit. This is electron centimeters. But now you get down to something like uh, 10 to the minus 26 electron centimeters, which is 10 orders of magnitude below um, the naive expectation. Um, and down here, there are theory, uh, some versions of supersymmetry actually predict that you would start to see some, uh, some, e some electric dipole moment. And eventually, there's a standard model prediction as well coming from the electroweak sector. Um, so that's really weird. Um, how do you uh, construct a um, theory that, that, uh, well, that avoids this charge separation? Somehow, the fundamental theory of the strong force is conspiring to make the wave functions of these quarks um, symmetric and spread out in the nucleus in such a way that there's no effectively charge separation is zero. Uh, so it helps um, to think about CP or time symmetry. Um, they're equivalent because in quantum field theory, there's always CPT symmetry. So, so you can think of violations of, char of uh, charge and parity or, or violations of time reversal. So imagine um, that my model for a uh, nucleon is a little uh, charged ball. Uh, and it has, we know that it has some uh, magnetic moments, so the ball is spinning. It's a spinning distribution of charge which produces a magnetic field. So imagine I have a spinning charged ball. And also now if it's gonna have a dipole moment, that means there's also a static charge separation, pluses and minuses. And so um, I'm just going to imagine that this is a spinning sphere, charged sphere with a little bit of uh, charge separation in a, in a, a, uh, you know, on the hemispheres. Um, now imagine, I think the time reversal is the easiest one to think about because if you, if you play the movie backwards, then instead of rotating in this direction, uh, which is required by the, the right hand rule, so this, if, you're, if you're spinning this way, then you get the magnetic moment this way. Well, in the mirror image, you're spinning the opposite way, so the magnetic moment uh, has changed direction, but the electric charge is still in the same place, uh, and you ha the electric charge is now, so the, the, the dipole moment's now pointing the opposite direction of the magnetic moment. And so imagine I, c I could make an experiment with some kind of spectrometer where I would measure the fact that these two vectors are pointed in the opposite direction in the time-reversed universe. So I can now tell whether I'm in our universe or the time u reverse universe by doing some kind of spectroscopy experiment, and that's no good. And there's a very similar argument for the parity flipping, where you, pl you place a mirror along the equator uh, and th things come out the same. So, um, okay, so that's a hint. So if you, if you imposed, uh, if you imposed, if you said that the universe shall be time reversal invariant or shall be CP reversal invariant, then y if you impose that on the theory of strong interactions, then automatically you'd have to have a, s a uh, distribution of charge that didn't produce an electric dipole moment. Uh, okay, so, so far so good. Um, but now things get complicated because it turns out that there was this, uh, this elegant theory of, the, of uh, the strong interactions, quantum chromodynamics. It turns out that it has a term coming from gluons that, that strongly violates CP. Uh, these are contractions of the gluon, of the gluon fields. And uh, this is the strong interaction constant. And this is the, this is the CP violating parameter in the strong interaction. And so from this Lagrangian term, you can calculate the neutron electric dipole moment. And um, it has this, this param in order for it to meet the experimental constraints, which are very tight, this parameter has to be incredibly tiny, but there's no fundamental reason in QCD why this parameter has to be so small, 10 to the minus nine. 
Uh, that can't be a coincidence. So then came along um, uh, Helen Quinn and Roberto Pecce. I'm sorry, my slides got cut off. Um, but uh, this is Roberto Pecce and Helen Quinn who invented the theory that turned into the axion. So they introduced a new field. Uh, so, so instead of, they, they took that constant, the CP violating constant in front of that term and they turned it into a field. And uh, then the uh, field had a, um, uh, has a symmetry breaking and the radial part of the field is shown in this drawing here. The radial part of the field at low energies takes on a vacuum expectation value. And so in the vacuum state, this parameter is not zero. And it turns out that if you calculate the minimum energy configuration, the minimum energy of QCD with this, with this new term added has no CP violation. So my, a colleague of mine says that they were th Pache and Quinn were thinking like electrical engineers. They constructed a feedback loop, you know, to phase lock their, their axion mass or something. So they, they zeroed out the... the um, they zeroed out the, the, the CP violation in the standard model dynamically. Uh, now this thing, this, this, uh, th this, this ball can no longer, is, is, is trapped at a certain radius, but it still has, a, um, it still has a, the ability to move around the axis because it sees a flat potential that way. And that motion, that's a Goldstone boson, which is, which was, is the axion. That, that motion corresponds to the axion. Um, initially, it has uh, zero mass. It has an entirely flat potential. Uh, but then another uh, miracle occurs, um, which is that during the QCD phase transition, when the universe goes from uh, you know, a quark-gluon plasma to free particles, this potential tilts slightly, and the axions no longer see a flat potential. They see a slightly curved potential. Um, and the ax in, in this curve potential, the axions uh, take on an effective mass. Uh, and the mass can be explicitly calculated apparently to three, almost three decimal places. And it all depends just on this vacuum expectation value of the, of the field. So there's, a, there's, a, there's one parameter that comes into all these models which determines practically everything. And that's this thing called the axion decay constant, which is the vacuum expectation value of the radial part of this uh, Peche Quinn field. Um, okay, so, uh, and, and here are the people who got famous for, well, some of them were already famous. Stephen Weinberg would be, they all of them would be pretty famous without this, but uh, Peche and Quinn are the people whose names are associated with the symmetry breaking mechanism. They didn't realize there was a new particle uh, that would come out of this, but Weinberg and Wilczek realized that that this implied the existence of a new particle calling, uh, corresponding to that radial degree, th the axial degree of freedom. And uh, they say that they named it after a detergent that was avail available at that time. Maybe you can still get it called axion. Um, but clearly they were also thinking about that axial rotation. Um, okay, so then uh, the other thing is that these theories can tell you exactly how much uh, axion dark matter exists in the universe with very few other assumptions. Um, and so here's, the, the model is, is this, is to imagine that um, the Petre Quinn uh, potential is a roulette wheel. So uh, the, 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 the vacu initially the vacuum energies are all degenerate. And so basically the universe just has to choose one of the entirely degenerate set of, va of vacua, which all have the same energy. So the guy dropped the ball onto the roulette, roulette wheel somewhere, somewhere in space. And then the quark, uh, the quark, uh, the, the QCD phase transition happened that I described that tilted the potential. So the roulette wheel tilted and then the ball started to roll. And the rolling of the ball, the potential energy that the ball had when it was tilted, that becomes the, uh, the mass density of axions. Um, and uh, an interesting thing is that of course, in early in the universe, there are many regions of space that are causally disconnected. And there's no particular reason for the the QCD potential to find um, any particular one of these vacua. So in different regions of space, it finds different ones. And so you have a different initial, what's called a vacuum misalignment angle. So the vacuum misalignment angle is different. And that implies that uh, different regions get different amounts of dark matter. And not only that, there's a boundary between the regions where you get uh, domain walls and cosmic strings forming 
due to the inability of the vacua to disagree which state they're in. Um, so uh, the most straightforward situation is if in the current universe we're seeing the average over all of these, uh, re over many of these regions, and then you can just assume that you've got the average, uh, average angle. And that corresponds to what sometimes is called the classic, classical uh, axion window. And in the classical axion window, everything basically is determined by that one parameter, Fa. So Fa, the vacuum expectation value of, the, um, of this potential in the radial direction, that um, determines the mass of the axion very precisely. It determines the coupling to gluons exactly. So we know the gluon coupling strength. It's all the same constant. And it also determines the coupling to photons, which is experimentally very important, up to some very small model-dependent parameters. So that the coupling to photons only varies within about a factor of three. And even the cosmological abundance. So if you make the assumption that we're averaging over many of those uh, uh, phase dom of, of those uh, domains of the of the um, uh, of the ground state, then uh, the cosmological abundance is very simply related to the mass of the axion. This simple expression, which you find in the particle data book, it is the vacuum alignment contribution. It doesn't include the cosmic strings or domain walls, because those. Uh, you can't do that with a simple analytical formula, but people have done uh, complicated simulations of the formation of the domain walls and the strings, which eventually evaporate into axions. And including those contributions, uh, you, get a, you get a different uh, answer for the abundance of axion dark matter. Uh, so then what everybody does is you, 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 you know, for a given FA, you can now predict how much axion dark matter you had. And so let's just say that all the dark matter observed in the universe, the canonical 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter is due to axions. What mass, what FA would you need to get that abundance? So that uniquely chooses FA, and then FA tells you what the mass is. So basically there, there are, this, this is amazing because unlike in the, the situation with the WIMPs where uh, there, you know, the, the, the parameter space is very diffuse, both in mass and in cross-section. The axion parameter space, with some very reasonable assumptions, collapses to a v specific mass and a specific coupling to um, photons within that factor of three that I told you about. And this is the range of recent results that included the simulation of the evaporation of cosmic strings and so on. The most recent is this one, I believe, and I think the I think the answer is 23. The axion is exactly 23 micro EV within 10 per plus or minus 10 percent. Um, and this is this is an area that we'll target with experiments, as I'll tell you later. So this is pretty amazing, um, and that's a that's that's I think this slide is this this is the axion miracle. Under simple assumptions, you can exactly predict the mass and the coupling. Everything is fixed. Um, and so then the only problem is that those, uh, uh, it's practically impossible to test those models. Um, at least in the past, it has been impossible. Uh, this, so this band, um, because it's so hard to actually get to that QCD band defined by just a single parameter, um, it's very fashionable to expand into a second parameter. So now you have a plot, a sensitivity plot that looks just like the one for WIMPs where you've got coupling strength on one axis axion mass on another axis, and the QCD band appears here in, in yellow. Um, so uh, the things that are not on this band, you could question whether you should really call them axions. They're not the axions that solve the CP problem. Um, and maybe they're not that interesting as dark matter, but they're generically called axion-like particles, and people look for them. Uh, they're, and there are, th there are some cla there, there are classes of experiments here called light shining through walls and helioscopes that are uh, work by looking for axions from the sun. And the next part of my talk, I'm going to tell you about those. And then I'm going to tell you about the things called haloscopes, which we, such as ADMX, which we're building to actually probe into the QCD uh, band. Um, okay, so uh, first let's talk about light shining through walls. This is a very elegant concept. Uh, the idea is that if you have a magnetic field, you have a process called the Primakov process where the, uh, 
the um, the axions can't tr uh, axions and gamma rays cannot interconvert with one another in free space because the axion has a mass and the gamma ray doesn't, and so there's a mismatch of of uh, energy and momentum. But if you are if you add a magnet, now the um, now the this interaction can borrow a little bit of momentum from the magnet. The magnet gets a little kick, and you can you can satisfy conservation of energy and momentum. And the probability for this to happen is determined by this coupling G uh, alpha gamma gamma, which is the one that was plotted on the previous slide. So if you put, if you shine a light, let's say from a laser into a magnet, then you have a probability that the laser photons will convert into axions. And it actually looks exactly like a neutrino oscillation experiment. If you're familiar with neutrino oscillations, I think covered in other lectures at this course, the formula is practically the same. There's delta m squared L over E. So you're, you're, as the laser is, co is going through this magnet, it's building up an amplitude for, it's building up an axion amplitude. At a certain point, actually, it will convert entirely into axions, and then it would convert back into photons. But before you, bef in practice, the magnets are rarely that long. So before the, uh, before the um, axions have converted, the laser has converted all the way into axions, you just put a wall there. So that the wall blocks the uh, photons, allows the axions to go through. The axions then enter a, a second magnet, and they start the oscillation process again. Some of them convert into photons, and then you detect the photons with some kind of detector, like a photomultiplier tube or a transition edge sensor or something more sophisticated. Uh, so there's really one, this is a really elegant concept, but there's one big downer, which is you'll notice there's two vertices. And so you've got, to, you've got to use this really tiny G alpha gamma gamma coupling two times, and th they get squared. So the whole process comes out proportional to G alpha gamma gamma to the fourth power. Uh, magnetic field also enters with the fourth power and the mass of the axon with the eighth power. Um, so um, that's going to limit your sensitivity. But people have done these experiments. And, uh, here's, here's one that was a, s a relatively simple one that was done at Fermilab about a decade ago now using an old Tevatron dipole magnet. And you know, so here's some ex more experimental details. You shine a laser into a magnet. It encounters a vacuum pipe of some sort, uh, which can be inserted it with a variable depth to change the oscillation lengths on the two sides. If, the ac uh, if there are axions, they, they fly through this pipe into another region where they oscillate back to photons and are detected by the photomultiplier tube. And there's a pulsed laser I think five, five nanosecond wide pulses. And so you just look, uh, th these are different configurations of polarization of the light with respect to the magnet. The, the, the laser light has to be polarized in the direction of the magnetic field for this to work. Um, and uh, different uh, depths of insertion of the, uh, the wall. And so you see that in time with the laser, there's no uh, excess of events. So no, ax no axions were discovered. Um, and you can set a limit. And here, here's a tabulation of limits set by previous experiments of this type. They vary in, um, so the, the older experiments basically vary in how much power was applied. Uh, there, one or two of them were done with x-rays and also one or two with microwaves as well. Um, so it's, you don't have to just use visible light. Um, and these are the results. And you get down to G, this is G alpha gamma gamma, and you get down to 10 to the minus seven. Um, which is very, very far away from the QCD axion band. Now, there are some um, really clever tricks which are being applied in the current generation of experiments. Um, so this is, sorry, now you can't see this again. This is resonant regeneration of the axion signal. So you can do two things here. Uh, you, take, um, you take optical, so you convert the, the uh, what was just a, a uh, decay pipe basically on one side of the magnet and on the other side into optical resonators. You put curved mirrors here and here and you let this uh, laser light bounce back and forth and build up power. So here you might, you, you basically here can build up as much power as you want until the mirrors are about to get fried. And that implies uh, stored um, laser power of, um, you know, on the order of kilowatts. Uh, and then on the other side, you have no such constraint because presumably very few photons are regenerating. And so you can have a very high Q resonator on the receiver side. And there's a resonance, 
which increases the uh, signal power by an amazing factor. It's the, the signal power is multiplied by the product of the finesse of the two optical resonators. So the finesse is essentially the number of times that the light bounces back and forth. And so you can get this huge factor. You get on the receiver side about 10 to the 5, and on the um, pa uh, pump side you get about 10 to the 4. So you get, you get a factor of 10 to the 9 increase in uh, signal power. Uh, which is it's fantastic, um, but there's a caveat. Unfortunately, the coupling sensitivity only goes as the fourth root of the power because the coupling entered as the fourth power. And so at the end of the day, it's maybe not as exciting as you would have thought. Um, you get two orders of magnitude increase. Uh, so here's, an, and here's, what, here's a, the current version of this. It's a pretty big program at DESI in Germany. The first one call, was called ALPS-1, which had just power buildup on the uh, laser side. And the second one, which is under construction now, also has um, a, a phase-locked optical cavity on the receiver side. And so, uh, you know, they're going to have a buildup to 150 kilowatts of input power. They've got a, a, a quality factor of 40,000 on the receiver side. And then they're going to a huge array of magnets left over from the HERA accelerator which it's interesting because Hera, Hera was a you know, circular accelerator and this has to be done. Well, light, doesn't go in, light only goes in a straight line. You can't bend it. So they're actually having to straighten all of these magnets in some huge machine that bends them. They were curved and now they're being bent back straight. But they've managed to do this with, I think, uh, something like 100 magnets. And so they're going to have um, uh, 468 tesla meters of magnet. Uh, compared to only 22 tesla meters in the first experiment. So by combining all these factors, they get a sensitivity gain of 3,000 over previous generation experiments. There's a lot of complicated optics. And this sounds simple to have this regenerator cavity, but phase locking the cavity to the first, to the transmitting cavity is non-trivial. And so there's a lot of complicated uh, optics involved. Um, but this is where they're going to go. Uh, so it's a big loop in sensitivity compared to ALPS-1, which is up here. And this is ALPS-2. It actually goes into a region where there are um, considered by some people to be hints of the existence of an axion-like particle that is causing the universe to be more transparent than it should be to gamma rays. So gamma ray telescopes look at faraway objects. The gamma rays at some point should start... Uh, I guess, interacting with the intergalactic uh, light background, and they should do uh, electron-positron production. So this would reduce the transparency of the universe, and there's a bit of a puzzle. Why, do you s why can you still see th these gamma ray sources that are so far away? Supposedly, this could be explained by, um, by an axion that allows you to increase the transparency. Um, anyway, this ALP, that's one of the motivation, and ALPS-2 will push into that region. But you can see that you're still so far away from the QCD axions that you will never get there with the light shining through wall experiment, even with, even with all of these tricks. Uh, OK, so what about the solar axion experiments? These are also really cool. And it's the same idea, except you just replace the laser with the sun. Um, the sun has a lot more photons than the laser could possibly have. And the sun also has built-in electromagnetic fields from the, the plasma in the sun. And uh, so the, plas the magnetic and electric fields in the sun are able to convert the photons into axions. Um, and the, um, so it's actually interesting that, th that the flux is very well determined. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can read paper the classic papers by Raffelt. This is in 2006, there's a review, and he also wrote a book on this kind of thing. Uh, so if you had... Uh, G alpha gamma gamma at the current level of sensitivity of other experiments, then you would have three 10 to the 11 axions per square centimeter uh, passing through the Earth. And this corresponds to about 0.2% um, uh, of the solar luminosity. So this is also interestingly at the point where the loss of energy of the sun and other stars from axions would start to affect their properties that you can observe astrophysically like the lifetime of stars. And there are many papers on how the lifetime of stars would be affected by G alpha, gamma, gamma. Uh, so um, th th this is quite a contraption, actually. It's an LHC dipole. 
which is mounted like a telescope on a thing that rotates, it can only point briefly at sunrise and also they, they also they might they, they might as well look at sunset too. So as the sun is setting beyond the horizon, there's a brief period where the axions are coming the opposite direction. So they instrument they instrument both sides of this thing with uh, X-ray detectors because the axions are predominantly produced by X-rays in the sun, and so the photons will be X-ray photons. Um, and then uh, they have expands to ex even to expand this to a gigantic project called IAXO, where they have much a much bigger magnet and much more ability to adjust its height, so you can track the sun for longer. And it has uh, eight barrels, and it has X-ray telescopes in every barrel. Uh, and they've been trying to do this for a long time. Um, it looks like it's very expensive. But the idea generally is that you would use tech. So one, one of the things I didn't mention is that there you get a boost in sensitivity by using X-ray optics, like the kind of stuff that Tali uses for his, uh, his X-ray rocket experiments. You have... Um, these uh, thin shell uh, focusing uh, mirrors, which, ha which so, uh, so X-rays come in at very shallow angles and are able to be reflected by these thin shells and brought to a focus. And this allows you to reduce the background for photo detection because you only have to detect the photons over a very small uh, physical area. Uh, and then the magnet technology is going to use something like the Atlas uh, toroidal magnet uh, so it has um, it has many bores where the magnetic field is is sort of is linear is well within each bore it's linear uh, like that. So the original the original magnet used a dipole configuration where the um, magnetic field lines were all going in one direction, and this uh, is a little bit more complicated because they were going around in each segment they're changing direction a little bit. Um, but it allows you to achieve a very um, very high very large magnetized volume, which is what's important for getting the power up. Um, so here, uh, this shows the summary of where you could eventually go with these uh, solar axion experiments. Uh, this is, um, this is the, the existing project called Ca CAST, the one the picture was on the previous slide at CERN. And you can see that AXO, because of this enormous magnet and other improvements, is a gigantic jump. And actually, this does start to get into the interesting region for the QCD axion. It enters it over here at um, masses about 10 to the minus 3 EV, which are, that's not the favored region for axion dark matter. Remember that several slides ago, I explained the calculations suggest that the, uh, that the mass might be 20 micro EV. It could go up to, a, the favored region really is from a few micro EV up to a few hundred mic micro EV but doesn't, quite, doesn't really get to a milli EV. So this, is, this has become scientifically much more interesting because you could certainly doubt the reliability of those calculations, um, but it doesn't get down into the best, what we think of as the best region. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna start to talk about the most promising technique today, which the technique used by ADMX, which is called uh, the haloscope technique, it uses resonant um, microwave cavities to convert the axions into microwave radiation. This idea was invented by Pierre Sakivy in an absolutely classic paper in 1983, very short paper. He proposed both this technique for looking for dark matter axions and the one for looking for axions from the sun, uh, all in the same place. Uh, so basically, the entire experimental field of axion physics was proposed in this one paper, uh, which is sort of a must read. Anyway, uh, the idea is that the, um, there's the, the same Primakov is effect is responsible for converting axions actually now from the galactic halo, not from the sun or a laser, but real dark matter axions into uh, photons. And the photons are stored in this cavity and then they're measured with sensitive uh, microwave receivers that I'll talk about later. The power is very low. It is on the order of 10 to the, for, so for a realistic experiment, it's on the order of 10 to the minus 22 watts. That's for an RF cavity, a uh, few hundred liters, magnetic field, eight Tesla. You can do better than that nowadays. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, there's a form factor which measures the uh, which depends on which cavity mode you're trying to receive the axion in. I'll discuss that later, but it's, it's of order one. Uh, 
And then here's the coupling that you're trying to measure, which as I've already mentioned, depending on different axion models, can vary by about a factor of three. Depends on the dark matter mass, depends on the axion mass, uh, I mean, th sorry, the dark matter density and the axion mass. Uh, and so um, you put all of these, f these things together and you get 10 to the minus 22 watts, which is unfortunately still a really small number. Uh, the history of this is that uh, experiments after Sikivi's paper, experimental efforts started up uh, at Brookhaven, University of Florida, and at Fermilab, and there was a first generation of experiments that used transistors as amplifiers. I'll show you what their sensitivity is in, a few in a another slide or two. And then there was a second generation, of AD which was called ADMX1, uh, which included most of these, the people who were in these previous experiments as, cl as collaborators. So the field kind of collapsed into ADMX. And now, um, after about 20 years of doing this, there's now a, 30, a third generation of experiments. And these are characterized by taking advantage of much lower noise temperature amplifiers, which have been developed mainly for applications to quantum computing, quantum information science, and other related fields. So there's a huge, uh, there's a huge other group of people interested in uh, microwave amplifiers that have been pushing amplifier technology all this time. And they've gotten recently a pretty significant leap in sensitivity. So this is what's enabling the third generation of experiments called which ADMX G2, which is what I'm working on and what I'm going to tell you about. There's another thing called Haystack, and there's an effort in Korea to do a number of simultaneous experiments of the same type. And actually, um, then even people are thinking about R doing R&D and thinking about a next generation of experiments, which I suppose is what you guys, if you work in this field, would end up working on is the next generation. And that would take us beyond what's known as the standard quantum limit for microwave receivers. That's the limit which, uh, if, you do the, if you do the measurement in a naive way, is constrained by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which tells you that Every time you try to measure the energy state of a harmonic oscillator, you can measure no, no less than half a quantum of, um, of energy. So um, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. OK, so this is, what, uh, this is what current generation ADMX looks like, again, with the captions cut off. Um, but you can see that there's a, there's a big magnet down at the bottom, and there's a big uh, microwave resonator. There's a microwave resonator cavity. So here's where the axions arrive and are converted to photons and bounce around. Then there's a package of electronics, which is way up here. The reason the electronics are up here is that the, electro the superconducting electronics cannot tolerate being in a strong magnetic field, which shuts down the superconductivity. So you have to put the um, you, you have to separate them, and you put a you put a second smaller magnet here pointing in the opposite direction that actively cancels out the flux from the first magnet. So all of that makes this thing large. Notice this thing is pretty long, and it's cryogenically complicated because it has to be cooled now to around 100 millikelvin. There's a lot of mass, and it's physically large. Uh, so this is a dilution refrigerator mixing chamber here that in our last run cooled to 90 millikelvin. It's attached to the top of the cavity. Uh, so um, this is what the site setup looks like. It's at the, located at the University of Washington. Um, the uh, magnet is in a pit in the floor for safety, and there's a helium liquefier and a clean room. You can see this is a pretty small university scale experiment. It's not some huge national lab thing or in an underground lab, if you don't like going underground. Uh, and uh, this is what the magnets look like. So this is the 50 centimeter bore eight Tesla magnet. And then this thing here, that's the smaller magnet that we use to cancel the field from the big magnet. Um, and I think in the interest of time today, I'm not going to talk about the different modes that we use to detect, detect the axions, but I will talk about them tomorrow. So I'll, I'll just move on. Uh, we do have this, so this resonator, si since the, uh, we don't know what mass the axion is, well, we're, we're assuming it's not 23, we're, let's just assume for the moment that it's not 23 uh, microv plus or minus 10%. We're trying to scan over a, a um, eventually a range of a few hundred microv. 
So we don't know what the mass of the micro, we don't know what the axon mass is. So that means we don't know what frequency exactly to look for the, uh, to look for the axion. So we have a tunable cavity. There are uh, two tuning rods here. And as you move the tuning rods, you can squeeze the electric field pattern in the TM010 mode of this cavity, which is the mode that we use to detect the axions. So you, um, you, you squeeze, as you squeeze the field with these rods, it moves up to higher frequency. And you typically can, with this kind of setup, you can get about an octave in one, in, in one apparatus. So you can get, let's say, from 500 megahertz to one gigahertz. And after you've done that, then you would need to swap out the tuning rods for bigger tuning rods or the cavity for a small t smaller cavity, and then you move on to the next op octave. So there's no one experiment that's going to cover the whole range all at once. You have to do it in little chunks. And so then uh, uh, you can measure what the frequency is by send you send in um, some microwave radiation and uh, let it bounce around and come back out. And uh, if, if you're on, if, if the microwaves are at the frequency of the cavity, then they're absorbed. And if they're not at the frequency of the cavity, they're reflected. Uh, there is more than just, so, so this, this shows here what happens to the frequency of the TM010 mode, which we use for detection as a function of rod position. And you're, you tune in frequency as you change the rod position. But there are also, notice there are also these other blue lines. These are uh, these are other resonant modes of the cavity which are no good for axion detection. So the trick is here is you have to know what mode you're in and you have to avoid every time you collide with, uh, with one of these other modes, there's a little gap in frequency coverage and you have to watch out that as you come through the collision, you don't start following the wrong resonance on the other side. So oh, I always forget that I can just click this. Okay, so... Uh, so then there's the issue of the amplifiers. The as I mentioned, the big advance in the field is by move has come by moving to um, lower noise amplifiers. And the thing we've used in our recent runs is called a microstrip squid amplifier. This is very, very similar to a DC squid. So if anyone has worked with DC squids, this basically is a DC squid, except for a trick that I'll tell you in a minute. DC squid, you can think of as a flux to voltage transducer, with, which is very sensitive to flux. As you, uh, because flux through a superconducting loop is quantized in units of the, uh, well, in units of you know, flux, fundamental flux quanta. And so um, you, um, uh, as you move by one flux quantum, the voltage swings by its full range and then comes back down again. So you're sensitive to a tiny fraction of one uh, quantum of the magnetic field. Uh, and um, generically, these, this, this is the simple electrical diagram, but in reality, things will look a little bit more like this, where this gray ring is the ring of superconductor and the Josephson junctions where the electric, uh, where the voltage develops are down here. Uh, and these are our shunt resistors, which are necessary to make the whole scheme work. Uh, so the, the trick is, um, DC squids, the DC squids are misnamed because actually the physics of DC squids works up to many gigahertz. DC squids are routinely used at megahertz frequencies like for CDMS. If you want to go up to gigahertz, although the, f the basic physics of squids works at gigahertz frequencies, it works up to the frequency where you start to break Cooper, Cooper pairs in the superconductor, which can be many tens of gigahertz. The problem is getting the microwave energy into the squid and the signal out. And so uh, what uh, has been done here is an adaptation of the squid where the input is a, um, is a, mi a linear microwave resonator. It's a strip line. If, if any of you are familiar with uh, microwave engineering, a strip line looks like this. It's a conductor separated by a dielectric from a conducting plane. And this can function as a transmission line for microwaves. So if you take one of these transmission lines and you break it in two places and capacitively couple it to the rest of the world, then there's a resonance that develops that depends on the length of the strip line. And uh, that's what's been done here. So the length of this thing has been arranged to resonate at the frequency where you want to detect the axion. And a uh, variable capacitor has been added so that you can effectively change the electrical length. So one end of the strip line has a capacitor which changes the phase of the reflection 
at the end of the line. And in that way, the effective electrical length is changed and the resonant frequency can be tuned also about, by about an octave. And here you can see the strip line meandering around the, the superconducting ring and the flux. So this thing will start resonating and produce magic magnetic flux that threads the center. Uh, and um, that's how you couple the microwaves into the squid. So the performance of these things is really nothing short of amazing. Uh, noise is typically measured in units of noise temperature, which is a measure of noise power per unit frequency bandwidth. Uh, there's a quantum limit coming from Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which at, at, um, at the frequencies that where we're operating is about, uh, let's see, what was it? I think it was about 20, uh, mil uh, 30 millikelvin. It's written here. And the actual noise temperature measured in these devices is only about a factor of two. It's a factor of 1.7 above the um, above the quantum limited uh, noise temperature. So this is this is more than an order of magnitude lower than what was previously achieved with um, with uh, FET amplifiers. Uh, now in operation, you have to worry about the system noise temperature, which turns out not just to be due to the the noise of this uh, amplifier device, but also has contributions from black body radi radiation in the cavity, from attenuation of going into the cavity, and from some other post-amplification stages. And I think I'll have to talk about those things tomorrow because I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do is I think not to, le not to leave you hanging entirely <coughs> as I will talk about uh, the signal that we see. So. Typically, um, the way we operate this experiment is we cool down the cavity, cool down the refrigerator, turn on the magnet, start amplifying microwaves, start moving the, move the antennas to a particular frequency we're interested in, and then we integrate. Uh, we record uh, a voltage trace from the cavity um, for 100 seconds at a time, and then, um, then we do a fast Fourier transform and look for the appearance of the signal. Uh, so this is what you would get if you if you squirted in a synthetic signal for a QCD axion at the two edges of the of the yellow band that we've talked about. This is the low edge, the DFSZ axion, and this is the high edge, the KSVZ axion. And uh, the the real signal we're looking for is somewhere in this range, and this shows that we can we can detect that with about a hundred uh, seconds of integration time. Um, so some of this I'll be able to cover tomorrow, uh, but this is the final result that came out this year. Is that for the first time ever, ADMX was able to probe this DFSZ region um, of um, the coupling space over what is just a very small fraction of an EV um, frequency range or mass range. But nevertheless, it shows that the technique works, and the fundamental thing is the implementation of these new, uh, much more sensitive amplifiers. And so uh, there's good prospects now for continuing this march upward in frequency and covering this whole range where I told you, th there, there, you know, the calculation suggests that the axion is supposed to be. And I think um, I'm just going to stop right there for now. So let's take a couple of questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a, a theoretical question that I didn't understand from the... How do you t determine the, the coupling constant? Uh, you said you had a vacuum, a random value, and then you have an expected... I didn't understand how did you get a prediction for that? Well, so the, the coupling constant is, um, so in the, 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 the coupling constant to gluons is determined exactly because, it's because that coupling is, so the, the, the Petri-Quinn field is directly coupled to the gluons. Okay, so, you, so one way to think about it is that now since um, the, the axion has the same quantum numbers as the pion, that there's actually a mixing of, uh, of pion and uh, axion. And we know, the, we know the pion coupling to two photons, pions decay into two photons. So you can think of the axion as inheriting its 
coupling to photons from this from this uh, small mixing. But there is some model dependence there, which leads to this factor of three in uncertainty in what the coupling actually is. Next question. Um, if I understand correct, the, the axion uh, interacts with the magnetic field and emits a photon, and you try to get this photon. Yep. Roughly is yep. this. So what's the order of this magnetic field? I didn't get this. Uh, the, uh, the ex experiment. What's th what is the the or the order of the magnetic field? Well, so the field the field in this experiment is about eight tesla, uh, and so that is uh, if you look at the power equation, uh, let's see, it goes um, power goes as the magnetic field squared. It actually goes as the uh, s magnetic stored energy. So um, you o you always will increase the power in proportion to b squared v, which is the energy stored in the magnet. And uh, you'd like to increase sensitivity by increasing V and increasing V. And tomorrow I'm going to tell you about ways to get to um, larger volume and larger stored energy. I remember that there is a proposal to to search for axions near the LHC being, uh, you know, it's th basically the first, I think, the first experiment, but uh, uh, looking... I don't, so I don't, I, d I don't know specifically about that experiment, but there are some models in which there, there can be strong coupling of axion-like particles to charge. So, so we've mostly talked about the coupling to photons. But there are some models where there are also strong couplings to charged particles, and so you could radiate a, a high mass axion, and then if it's if it has a large enough energy, let's suppose it was a one electron volt axion, and it's strongly, relatively strongly interacting with the standard model, then you could detect it in a more conventional detector. I thought that the experiment will use the beam to produce an axion and then go inside this thing. Oh, uh, no, no. So I'm not aware of any of any attempts to do that. OK, let's go for our last question. Hey. Uh, are there any evidence of actions in neutrinos, neutron stars? Uh, I think that, so, I, so not, as, not as far as I'm aware. I know that there are proposals. Actually, if you, if you go and look at the, um, at the proceedings of IDM, the, conference, the, the dark matter conference that happened last week at Brown University, there, are, there is a proposal to use, the, to use radio telescopes to look at axion to to look at neutron stars and there's a uh, prediction that as axions fall into a neutron star there's a region there's a resonance region where they'd be very efficiently converted into photons which you could detect in uh, this current generation of very sensi sensitive radio instruments like the square kilometer array so as far as i know there are no detections but i think that there are there may be some exciting proposals for how to use neutron stars Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Yeah. We go for the coffee break and we'll be back in 15 minutes.